You can sit in chairs. <laughs> Don't Starve is a video game. Video games have updates. Uh, I don't know, man. It's been like two months. How do I make intros again? Don't Starve is a game that gets regularly updated. Most updates, yeah, pretty good. Not usually a massive deal. But what if I told you the most recent update was a massive deal? What if I told you that it revolutionized the way you play DST? Well, it will in the future. And those aren't my words, that's what the developer says. So don't expect anything nutty just yet. Not that it isn't a neat update, it's cool, just not nutty yet. Also, yeah, I'm just going to pretend that Taking Root and Terrors Below are the same update because A, they probably should have been, and B, are for grow. Rifts will now spawn in the world, spewing lunar energy. This will now occur in all worlds after Celestial Champion has been defeated, all by enabling it in the World Options menu. This means that if you initially decide to beat CC and then realize you don't have 30 hours of your life to dedicate to accessing the new content, you can just enable it post world gen. After the setting is enabled manually or by beating the boss, rifts will appear in places you'd least expect, causing swathes of extraterrestrials to spew forth onto your homeland. Concerningly quickly, you decide that these foreign intruders have no place in your plane of existence and quickly get to dispatching them. Plenty of lunar themed items can be obtained from mining the crystals found near rifts, their use is soon to be unveiled. Meanwhile, if you are spending time farming or exploring, you might have noticed a nasty new garden plot invader, taking up root amongst your precious food crops or in a previously disregarded corner of the world. Should you decide to take them on head to head in mortal combat, beware, for the new enemies possess some kind of planar defense, making them extraordinarily tough to take down. If you're one of those people who enjoyed farming before, you can kiss that mentality goodbye because these annoying ass things pop up all the time while sowing and growing your crop. While simple enough on their own, they often spawn in groups of three, requiring a tricky kiting pattern to successfully dispatch. Get it? Dispatch? Because they're... Because <laughs> they're in your garden patch. All the while, any cave dwellers may notice a strange new presence in the atrium post fuel weaver defeat. Once the almighty guardian of the true ruins is defeated, something waits in the shadows offering you a deal. It wishes for Dreadstone, a particularly nasty material introduced in the previous update, and obtained by goading this great fat pig thing into breaking some pillars for you. Once you give the shadowy hand what it wants, it'll reveal itself to be controlled by none other than the Shadow Queen herself. After being stuck on the Shadow Throne for so long, the Queen is feeling a bit socially anxious, so she doesn't really say anything, but with a flick of her wrists, the ruined ancient portal is repaired. This is something I've wanted to see in the game for a very long time. Like, a very long time. Now Charlie is an actual force in this story, and not someone who just appears in cinematics and comics. Big ups. Though it is a bit weird that she appears in the cinematic art style, not the in-game art style, seeing as she's, you know, in the game. But it's understandable since this is her first game-make appearance. Now, from the portal, some truly sickening horrors will emerge. No, not these things. Some horrors so horrific, they'll make the caves an inhospitable parody of hell. Something so terrible, it'll make you never want to step foot underground ever again. Something... Ah! Earthquakes will now drop boulders everywhere, rendering cave basing borderline impossible. Additionally, acid rain is also a new thing. This weather event is like the antithesis of the word fun. It rots your food, damages you over time, and generally stinks like a Reddit admin. And best of all, it can't be blocked, except with the use of one extremely particular item. Even possessing 100% wetness protection does heck all, only serving to destroy your rain protection gear. So I guess you're just supposed to leave the caves when it starts? I honestly don't know. On the bright side, this drizzle of nitrate caused cave ponds to form salagmites composed of nitra, a resource that can be kind of hard to obtain late game. So there's that, a new way to obtain a common resource. You know, after defeating the hardest boss in the game. After spending some time in the caves, a particularly noticeable thing will appear on the map. Investigate it, if you dare. This red blotch is none other than the Shadow Rift, from which all sorts of otherworldly nonsense will spill. One of these things is a lung-filling fog that must be purged by fire. Any burning light source will make the fog shrink away, clearing the area for safe exploration. But be careful, because nasty things lurk within. <laughs> Boo! It's me! <laughs> Just kidding. Fused Shadelings are horrific little whippersnappers that can do nasty things like jumping at you and burrowing into the ground, making a little thing that goes pop. 
Despite the unassuming animations, this little red thing does almost as much damage as most boss attacks. Upon death, the angry little ankle biters will drop some pure horror, but don't get to looting just yet. A little explosive might will be waiting for any scavengers, rapidly chasing after them and then exploding. Fun fact, if you don't have a speed boost of any kind, dodging the mites attack is nearly impossible. So there's that. Like their lunar counterparts, the shadelings and mites both have planar armor, meaning they take eons to kill without specialized gear. To be honest, I wish that these new enemies, particularly the lunar grazers, would play into the themes of lunar mutation and such, with some more interesting and grotesque designs, instead of just being funny eggs that go pop. But DST is apparently watered down to the point where anything even remotely disturbing is blacklisted, so whatever. The rifts add another, and probably the intended main way of obtaining pure horror. However, gathering yourself dreadstone is still mostly done by goading the nightmare werepig, or playing as Wilson. Although, there is another way. Once the shadow rifts are active in the caves, three devious rag-wearing miscreants can be found at the nearest fissure. No, it isn't the local gang of homeless men who terrorize nearby parking lots. <laughs> but rather three equally as devious, but notably more shadowy creatures from beyond. This terrible trio will bombard the player with an assortment of difficult to dodge moves, requiring plenty of sidestepping and fancy footwork to avoid. Additionally, if you're playing as Wanda, I hope you enjoy dying because your life will be cut short in one to two short hits from this lot. I'm not entirely sure why, but it seems to be some kind of weird interaction between Wanda's health bar and planar damage. Finding some bunny men is actually a genius strategy if you're struggling with this trio of trouble. They'll attack the shadows on sight and absolutely shred them. However, actually locating this gang of evil ragmen is harder than finding community housing in this day and age. They'll spawn at the nearest fissure. Oh yeah, remember fissures? Those funny cracks in the ground that spawn shadows during nightmare phase? No, me neither. Apparently Clay forgot they exist as well because they don't have a map icon, meaning you might need to blindly blunder around the dark a little bit before you actually find one. Upon death, they'll drop a new resource called Dark Tatters. These can be used to build a new armor set and accompanying weapon, in a similar fashion to the lunar resources attained from moon-themed rifts. Each path, lunar or shadow, will have its own crafting station. The lunar stations obtained from the celestial orb or any of the three altars assembled on the lunar island. The shadow counterpart is sourced from a fully repaired ancient pseudoscience station. Both are created with some new resources from their respective faction, and can be placed anywhere. Both the new crafting stations grant access to an armor set, at least one weapon, and a small assortment of hybrid tools. On the lunar side of things, the bright shade armor and helm make the first new armor set, rewarding its wearer with 80% base protection, 25% further against lunar themed mobs, and some planar protection to boot when both pieces are equipped. When worn in combination, it also boosts damage dealt by all the new lunar weapons and tools by 10%, with an additional 5 planar damage. But what actually is planar damage? Well, to tell you the truth, I don't really feel equipped to explain it, mostly because I don't have a degree in advanced mathematics, but I'll give it a shot anyway. Oh, and if you're feeling a bit spicy, take a shot every time I say the word planar in this upcoming paragraph. In short, planar damage is basically armor piercing. Some forms of defense, including player armor, is completely ignored by it. Planar protection, a stat that the new monsters have which makes them extremely hardy towards regular weapons, is also ignored by player-wielded planar damage. However, normal enemy armor such as cave spiders in their shell or the fuel weaver's shield still blocks planar damage as normal. This armor piercing ability also counts in receiving damage from mobs with planar damage themselves, so watch out. Additionally, planar damage when wielded by you is notably not affected by damage boosts of any sort. So screw Wolfgang in particular, I guess. Of course, this also means that Wendy's downside is irrelevant post Big Boss. Oh wait, it was irrelevant anyway. Finally, the new armor sets grant planar defense, notably distinct from planar protection, the version that the enemies have, which provides resistance against planar damage wielded by enemies. This means you have a somewhat lower chance of being one-shot by those annoying ass might things. Planar defense usually comes with a flat planar damage reduction alongside a percentage reduction, which means it is trickier to calculate than regular armor, yay I love maths. Okay, do you see how this might be confusing? This is a YouTube video. Imagine trying to explain this new mechanic to someone who's never played this game before. The wiki page for planar damage is currently in absolute shambles, since no one can seem to really agree quite how it works. What happened to the days where we could simply hit monsters with legs of ham and they would die? Nowadays it's just too complicated. With all of that aside, Hopefully you might begin to understand this new system. I don't know about you, but I'm not a numbers guy, and having to do all these calculations on the run is a little bit difficult. What is this, math class? 
you know, I'm playing this game to have fun. There are a couple of mannequin structures you can use to test the damage of a specific weapon type against a faction of your pleasing. The problem is that these mannequins require the rare resources inherent to their respective alignment to actually build. So, gotta spend some to make some, I guess. The other items that the Bright Smithy offers are the Bright Shade Sword, Bomb, Staff, Shuval, and Smasher. The Sword is your main damage dealer from this category, dealing 38 damage plus 30 planar. Both these values are increased if you wear the full Onion Armor set, brutally snatched from the Honorable Sigvert of Katarina. It's me, Sigvert of Katarina. Someone's swiped my armor. Did you happen to see it anywhere? The Bomb is a throwable item that does a massive and immediate 200 damage in a small area, but at the cost of an immense amount of resources, including one unstable Moonglass, although this item can now be crafted from pure brilliance at a 1 to 2 ratio. Notably, all 200 damage is planar, meaning you can absolutely disintegrate any of the new enemies. Or yourself, if you're careless. The Staff is an interesting new ranged weapon, only dealing 10 planar damage per hit, but the projectile bounces between a few enemies, more if you're wearing the armor set. It also deals double damage to shadow creatures, meaning its best use is melting crowds of shadows at once, such as for a nightmare fuel farm in the ruins. Finally, the Bright Shade Smasher and Shuval are both hybrid tools, the Smasher being a pickaxe and hammer hybrid, and the Shuval being a combination of a shovel and a hoe, meaning that they uh, combined your mum with a shovel. <laughs> both of them are also somewhat cheap to craft, and are extra efficient at their respective tasks, making them quite desirable. On the shadow side of things are a comparable assortment of tools and weapons craftable from the Shadowcraft plinth. The Void Cloth armor set is a decent alternative to the Dreadstone armor. While both suits of armor have similar durability, the Dreadstone set has its iconic regeneration ability, which in practice makes it much more durable. The Void Cloth set gives less defense from most mobs, but more planar defense, making it better suited towards fighting the new post big boss enemies. It also gives the set bonus damage buff to its weapon counterpart, something that the Dreadstone set is obviously missing. Both armor sets also have different crafting ingredients, obviously, so take your pick between the Nightmare Wear Pig or the Rag Trio. And on the topic of fashion, do you want to look like a lumpy cave beast or an evil shadow wizard? Not even a competition, I mean really. The Umbrella is a new item that appears to be a counterpart to the Umbrella, but is mostly meant to be the sole way of blocking acid rain. It gives 100% rain protection, but takes up that all too useful hand slot. And finally, the Shadow Reaper is a very interesting new weapon that benefits from the Void Cloth set bonus. Every subsequent attack you make against a singular target will benefit from a damage ramp up of sorts, maxing out at a whopping 88 damage total. The most notable thing about the Reaper is the ability to actually use it as such, except against vegetables, not people's souls or whatever. This makes it, in theory, quite the time-saving tool for farming, albeit at the cost of some tricky to obtain resources. In general, the two new weapons from this update are quite endearing. However, their high resource cost means that they're generally only worth using in combination with the right armor set and against enemies with planar protection. Otherwise, their damage output is simply not worth all those precious planar goodies. Just make a Dark Sword instead for all your day-to-day -day combats. Without the correct set, the Bright Shade Sword is a Dark Sword equivalent, but the Scythe falls far behind, dealing a measly 56 damage, as the bulk of its DPS output comes from the armor set's ramp-up effect. The same kind of goes for the armor. In my opinion, the durability of both sets is simply too low to justify the creation cost, especially for purposes outside of the intended anti-planar usage. Forcing players to use the armor sets kind of limits player creativity. If you want to make the most of the new equipment, the contents of all three slots on your person are both premeditated and non-negotiable. Changing any of them for something of your preference will result in your damage output receiving a crowbar to the knee. There's also something else that isn't fully realized in the game as of yet, but seemingly will be soon. In his skill tree, Wilson can choose to align with either the shadows or the moon, after defeating that side's respective boss, either Scalar Bones or Spherical Rock. These skills are mutually exclusive, which means that you have to choose one to stick with for that run. As Wilson, each affinity will give the crafting recipes for that side's fancy schmancy resources, as well as a 10% damage reduction from creatures representing that side in-game. Additionally, you'll deal 10% more damage against the opposite side. 10% damage is not a lot. Dealing like 8 extra damage at most means virtually nothing, since all mobs except bosses will die in the same number of hits. 10% damage resistance also means nothing. <laughs> I'm unsure if these values are placeholders or not. It's also unclear how other characters' alignments will affect their respective gameplay once they're added to the game. Will characters like, say, Maxwell, be able to pick a lunar alignment, or will they be stuck into picking Shadow? Will there be unique powers for each character, or will the affinities all simply give resistances and damage bonuses? 
If anything, this info all but confirms that yes, all characters will be getting skill trees so that they can actually choose an affinity. So suck it, doubters. Wow, talk about information overload. My pea-sized brain can barely handle all those ones and zeros. Normally I don't like talking about updates in this way, but there's just such a high volume of data here that I feel somewhat obliged to. Speaking of information overload, a smaller feature added here is the scrapbook, containing data on every- oh, Sorry, pop-up. <clears throat> containing data on every enemy, item, food, and- <sighs> One second. Containing data on food, enemies, and items found throughout the- Damn it! Throughout the game! And, well, I hope you like pop-ups, because every single time you walk past something you haven't yet entered into the book, this annoying ass pop-up appears on your screen. Pop-ups are something that I dislike. I hate every website that I visit asking me about cookies, or asking to send notifications, or telling me to turn off my ad blocker. Like, God, I don't care. Hell, even the self-serve checkouts at my local supermarkets are rife with pop-ups. Why? It genuinely feels like this absolutely god-awful user experience trope has invaded all aspects of my life. Generally, I play video games in order to escape this sort of brain cell degrading nonsense. And yet, here it is in DST. Worst of all is that the scrapbook doesn't actually provide any information of value. For the most part, health values of mobs aren't that important. It's their special abilities or interactions that players will be checking the wiki for. For example, a new player might want to know how to capture a mole worm to craft a raincoat or a pair of moggles. But alas, the mole worm page in the scrapbook doesn't actually mention its ability to be picked up with a hammer. Thankfully, you can disable the pop-ups in the settings menu, but still, it should be turned off by default. Finally, the actual pop-up itself is extremely ugly for some reason. It doesn't match the style of the GIF notification. Or hell, even the UI in general. Just why? On a positive note, seeing Charlie in this update is brilliant. I am admittedly a little bit disappointed that she doesn't say anything, but hey, it's good to see someone who's supposed to be the ruler of this world actually do something. My biggest thought about the weapons and tools in this update is that they generally aren't really worth it. If you're not fighting enemies that have planar protection, there simply isn't enough justification to spend all that time farming and fighting for either of the two sets. Honestly, the weapons, armor, and equipment all need significant durability increases at the bare minimum. Some more sources of planar damage for players are very much needed as well. As a player, all you really have are the four new weapons, most of which are prohibitively expensive considering the damage output, even including planar damage. Things like a Walter slingshot round that does planar, a wonder clock that does planar damage will be brilliant, seeing as characters who have their own special combat abilities are now boxed into using an extremely small pool of weapons, which definitely detracts from their unique appeal. Obtaining the two new sets is also difficult without planar damage, but the problem is these two new sets are the main sources of planar damage, meaning you paradoxically need the armor that the new enemies drop in order to fight them in the first place? Obviously the Nightmare Werepig's armor is a partial solution to this, but still. This is especially true for dealing with things like Bright Shades, which are very disruptive to the day-to-day -day life inside the constant. And of course, there are the usual issues of things being locked behind hours and hours of gameplay, and poorly explained slash not explained at all. But nearly every DSD update has those issues now, so mentioning it is basically moot at this point. The final problem with all of this is that this update has this weird feeling that is unfinished. Well, I guess that's because it is. This was worse when Taking Root had released by itself. In the words of the devs themselves, The content in Taking Root is too narrow in focus, and without the update that follows it, players not only can't see the bigger picture, but they really don't benefit from the update yet either. This means, realistically, the update is just kind of meh, without an understanding of what is to come. Even with Terrors Below being a thing now, there are still obviously a lot of missing pieces and confusing tidbits, like alignments being missing for every character. While understandable from a game development standpoint, as a player, it's a bit confusing to know that things will be a bit wonky for the next few updates, with a large portion of the game subject to change and yet to be revealed. This also means that this entire video will probably be irrelevant within a month. Yay. Ah! Anyway, thanks for watching, and yeah, I rebranded. Again. Hi! I am once again asking for your opinions on this update, the video, and the rebrand, I suppose. I'm always interested to hear what you lot have to say on things. As per usual, I always read every comment, although I can't guarantee a response, you'll know that I've seen it. Thanks, and I guess I'll see you next time.